Yes, hello once again, and another uh, warm welcome back to Classic Dirt Bike TV. And just before we get down to our next video posting, uh, a quick reminder of our first away event of 2023, which of course will be the annual Telford Classic Dirt Bike Show, which is on, on the uh, 11th and 12th of February at the Telford International Centre. So if you're into your old classic dirt bikes, then uh, that event at the Telford uh, Classic uh, Dirt Bike Show is certainly uh, worth a visit. And of course, uh, Classic Dirt Bike TV will also be in attendance over the course of the weekend to film uh, all of those uh, fantastic bikes that will be on display. And you'll be able to see them here at a later date here uh, on my channel. So right now we're going to get down to uh, our next video posting, which uh, is actually a bike that I uh, posted uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, since then I've uh, discovered some more information about this uh, very uh, rare machine. So let's get into that video now and take a look at this 1972 uh, prototype AGIS 500 Twin Shocker. Now here on Classic Dirt Bike TV, we always endeavour to try and bring you the very best content with regards uh, showcasing old, vintage and classic scrambles bikes. And uh, to be fair, in the past, some of those bikes have been uh, very good examples of our off-road racing history. But occasionally, we do come across some very rare bikes that are so iconic that uh, most of the motocross racing world hardly even knew they existed, which of course brings us to our featured machine, which uh, not only is a fully British built prototype, but is uh, the only one of its kind on planet Earth. Now I first uh, clapped eyes on this bike while I was at the Telford Classic Dirt Bike Show in 2019, but at that time uh, the owner it wasn't around to supply any details of its construction, but uh, eventually I did uh, track him down. And uh, as it turns out, uh, this machine here uh, belonged to classic dirt bike collector Terry Pickering, who uh, just happens to have this bike and many more like it in his private uh, motorcycle collection. So what we're looking at here is a 1972 AGIS 500 uh, prototype and uh, this bike was basically uh, a joint venture between uh, Norton Villiers Triumph uh, chief designer Graham Evans and legendary British motocross uh, legend Vic Eastwood who did all of the development and testing uh, on this bike. Now for 1972, this AGIS 500 project was uh, certainly a bit clandestine and very secretive for its time and it even had an operational title uh, which they called the Chindits uh, Project which was uh, taken from the name of a special forces unit that uh, saw major action during the conflict in World War uh, II. Now it's said that only a total of five of these 500 chassis uh, were ever made but only two bikes were uh, put together and when uh, Norton Villiers Triumph were heading into financial trouble during the 1970s uh, the Chindits project was then uh, cancelled and both bikes were then ordered uh, to be destroyed but as it happens our featured bike survived uh, making the, the only example left of that uh, secret project. And so what uh, happened then was that our featured bike here was then uh, dismantled by Norton Villiers employees and then all of the parts were then placed into boxes. And when Terry Pickering eventually found out that the bike uh, was available to buy, uh, Terry bought the entire contents and all the spare parts of that uh, Chindits project. Now, when Terry eventually had the time to uh, go through his uh, inventory of spare parts, he said that the uh, frame uh, was in very good condition and had already been chrome-plated, but uh, all of the engine and other spare parts were uh, in a pretty bad way and uh, those would need to be fully refurbished before uh, rebuilding 
uh, the bike. And because this was such a rare piece of British motorcycling history, uh, Terry was going to use every nut, bolt and washer that came with the bike during its uh, restoration. And so as we begin uh, with the bike's uh, chassis, which uh, was made from very light gauge tubular steel, and uh, basically this is a revamped and upgraded version of the same uh, frame that housed the old AGI-S410 Stormer uh, motor of the 1970s. And as I said, uh, there were only five chassis ever built with uh, one destroyed. So uh, what became of the other three frames is uh, anyone's guess, but uh, if you uh, have one of those frames in your possession, then you've certainly got yourself a little piece of British uh, motorcycling history. But once again, this 500 two-stroke engine is again uh, loosely based around the old 410 Stormer motor, but it's not identical uh, to that old engine because uh, this prototype uh, has some very innovative features uh, not associated with that original uh, 410 uh, power plant. So when Terry began the restoration of this 500 uh, prototype motor, the engine's uh, piston did look a bit uh, the worst for wear. And of course, uh, you can't just uh, phone Norton Villiers Triumph and ask if they've got uh, any prototype Chindit's 500 pistons in their possession. Although thankfully, uh, after raking through his inventory of spare parts, uh, Terry uh, bought with the bike, he came across a few original pistons, so he was then able to refit an original Hepolite piston back into this barrel. Now, also included in all of the spare parts that Terry bought with this bike it was this original uh, prototype water cooling barrel that uh, NVT were going to use during the bike's uh, development as it was intended uh, to make a water-cooled version of uh, this 500 engine uh, on future uh, models. But whether this prototype barrel was ever tried or even tested is uh, unclear. But uh, Terry was even given all of the original moulds for casting the engine's crankcases and uh, other engine parts when he bought all of the remains of this uh, secret uh, project from the ailing uh, Norton uh, Villiers company. But uh, as I said, when you first glance at this prototype motor, you can see immediately that it's not identical to that old 410 Stormer engine because the ignition and the clutch casings are on the opposite sides to the 410 uh, motor. And it's said that this was all done uh, to enable uh, the gear shifter to be placed on the left hand side as per all of uh, the Japanese bikes of their day. And this naturally would give the bike uh, much more uh, worldwide appeal having a left sided shifter if and when uh, this bike ever went into production. But the gearbox was uh, basically a four speed uh, unit and uh, was actually a Norton based uh, type of transmission which was uh, already a well proven uh, unit being used on other uh, Norton Villiers Triumph bikes. But quite a short uh, front folding kickstart as well here so uh, that big 500 might take a bit of uh, kicking into life to get it started and uh, also on this left hand side of the motor we have uh, the ignition unit which uh, was a, a Spanish FEMSA electronic uh, CDI ignition system and this would uh, supply all of the sparks needed to keep that 500 motor uh, on its toes. But this side of the engine was uh, quite well uh, thought through and uh, well engineered by the guys at NVT. And so moving on to the engine's clutch side, we have an all uh, metal plate uh, clutch. And as you can see again, that this 500's uh, clutch and casing are uh, on opposite sides from that original uh, 410 AGIS uh, Stormer motor. But the operation of the clutch 
was just kept uh, to a simple uh, cable operated system. Now, when the Chindits team were designing this brand new engine, it was thought that it would need at least a three section roller drive chain to connect that transmission to the crankshaft to make it strong enough and reliable enough for the 500's power. Although this idea was then scrapped because the three tier chain would be far too wide to fit inside this casing so another answer would have to be found and so a rubber tooth belt was then used which was lighter and quieter and of course required no lubrication. Now, when Vic Eastwood first tested the bike, he thought that the 500 engine had uh, sufficient grunt and pulling power in its stock trim that uh, it didn't need any form of reed valve induction on the engine's intake system. So it was just left as a simple uh, piston port uh, motor and was uh, fueled by a big uh, amal uh, carburetor, which was uh, tucked up here just behind at these at side panels. And uh, once more the air filter and air box was all uh, custom designed for this brand new bike which uh, was said uh, to keep that induction noise to a minimum but uh, more importantly of course keep dust and debris from entering that 500 uh, two-stroke engine. But other innovations by the Chindits engineers was to cast additional uh, cooling fins onto the bottom of this cylinder head to help cool the motor uh, during operation. Although whether uh, this quite radical idea did have any effect on keeping the engine cooler, uh, I don't actually know, but it's uh, a nice uh, talking point, uh, that's for sure. And uh, also, uh, because this big 500 two-stroke motor did have uh, a decent compression ratio uh, and that short uh, kickstart, it uh, would have taken a bit of turning over. So uh, a decompressor valve was also fitted into the top of the barrel just to try and assist the starting of this uh, 500 motor. And also to try and cut down on any vibrations from this 500 engine and its gearbox. It was then decided by the Chindits bigwigs to use these isolastic rubber mounts to isolate the motor and frame from any undue pulsations that would otherwise slacken off any of the bike's fasteners while it was running. But these particular parts here never needed remanufacturing because uh, NVT had already been using these parts on their big uh, 750 Norton Commando road bikes for quite some years. So in that respect, uh, these were already well tried and tested uh, motorcycle engine mounts. Now I'm pretty sure that you don't need me uh, to tell you that one of the more outstanding features of this bike is this quite uh, radical looking exhaust expansion uh, chamber. But inside this pipe here are a series of tubes and chambers which give uh, the 500 AJS motor its expansion uh, box effect. And the exhaust gases uh, then flow onto this small uh, tailpipe section here uh, at the end. And naturally this was all engineered to improve the gas flow uh, through the pipe, but it's uh, said that it was also to do with keeping the sound values uh, below that 90 decibel mark, uh, which was the operating standard uh, for off-road bikes of that uh, period. And the pipe also had this uh, very unique flexi uh, rubber joint in the middle uh, to allow for any movement between the engine and the chassis and try and lessen any breakages uh, while it was out there uh, on the track. But it's said that back in 1972, this was also a very quiet machine considering uh, the few times that it was raced on the track. And uh, with a pipe like this, I can understand exactly why it was uh, such a stealthy and quiet 
race bike. Although the other thing to consider here is that uh, this exhaust system it was fitted onto a prototype bike, so uh, naturally it was all experimental. So uh, who's to say that uh, if this bike ever made it into the production stage that it may have had a completely uh, redesigned exhaust system uh, then uh, bolted onto it. Although according uh, to our test and development rider uh, Vic Eastwood, he said that uh, this 500 two-stroke motor had uh, more than enough grunt to take on anything on the track in 1972 and in fact uh, the very first time that Vic uh, rode this bike competitively at a race event he took three race wins on its first time out. Okay, so uh, moving on to the bike's front suspension uh, system, which uh, I was told was just a beefed up and upgraded version of the original AGIS uh, Stormer forks that were bolted onto the old uh, 410 bike. But uh, rest assured, these are not the stock standard fork setup that were fitted to the 410 because it's well documented that Vic Eastwood spent many hours experimenting with different spring rates and oil weights trying to get these forks uh, to work a little better although uh, these uh, weren't perfect by any means but uh, this is basically uh, what you had to work with in the early uh, 1970s although it just goes to show you how obsessed with saving weight on this new bike that the Chindits uh, project engineers even cut excess metal uh, from the frame's headstock here in an effort to shed uh, precious grams of fat from their newly designed uh, chassis. And so moving now on to the stoppers of our NVT racer, which uh, as far as I'm aware are the very same hubs and brakes that would have been on the 410 uh, Stormer bike, and I'm not aware of any engineering upgrades to these stock old school uh, drum brakes, but I expect that uh, if these were good enough to slow down and stop the big uh, 410 bike, then I expect that these would be able to do a quite similar job on our slightly uh, larger uh, prototype. Now the bike's rear hub is again another alloy uh, 410 it's Stormer part that's uh, both light and superbly engineered as uh, you can see and to adjust the bike's uh, drive chain uh, to that back wheel you just simply uh, slackened off the rear uh, spindle nut and then uh, turned these eccentric uh, cam adjusters to either uh, slacken or tighten uh, the bike's uh, drive chain. And so because uh, this was a new prototype bike, uh, a brand new custom made fuel tank had to be manufactured to fit that uh, AGIS uh, chassis and also uh, to be able to hold enough gas to feed that 500 two-stroke uh, motor on even the longest of Grand Prix Scrambles races. But rather than go for a redesigned uh, fiberglass fuel cell like the old Stormer bikes, of the past, a nicely uh, sculpted alloy tank was then uh, manufactured instead. But this uh, tank here had to have uh, the capacity for fuel storage and also to be slim enough to allow the rider to move his weight from the front uh, onto the back of the bike. And the tank was also uh, finished off by having a Monza style uh, locking fuel cap on the top here, which uh, as you can see was placed onto the left hand side of the bike to make uh, refueling that little bit easier. But Terry uh, painstakingly rebuilt at least 98% at of this Chindits 500 on his own, although uh, the parts that he didn't make uh, for the bike were these uh, very nice alloy side panels, uh, which he outsourced uh, to his good friend uh, Graham Quick of uh, Quick uh, Motorsports who uh, made these uh, polished alloy side panels to fit the AGIS 
uh, frame. Now, originally, it's not actually clear as to what kind of panels, if any, were fitted uh, to the bike during its construction and testing. But uh, these alloy parts here uh, certainly complement the very high standard of workmanship that's gone into producing this uh, fantastic and very rare bike. But back in 1972, the chances are that uh, there would have been a pair of uh, girdling rear shocks that would be bolted onto this bike, and uh, if not girdling, then certainly something uh, very similar. But uh, in these modern times, uh, those old school uh, dampers, of course, are no longer available because uh, in the past, uh, those old shocks uh, wouldn't have been uh, serviceable or even uh, tunable other than maybe experimenting with different external uh, spring rates. But thankfully, uh, the world of motocross suspension technology has moved on in leaps and bounds, and uh, Terry's now uh, fitted a pair of these classic British-made Falcon units, which are uh, very good quality and uh, a major improvement on those uh, older dampers that would have been uh, fitted in the early uh, 1970s. Now, to bring back the Chindits AGIS's seat to a respectable level, the original seat base and its foam insert uh, was reused, whereby uh, the base was fully restored and its foam uh, then giving a thorough clean before uh, having a brand new seat cover uh, custom made to bring uh, the seat back to a better than brand new uh, finish. But as you can see, there wasn't a lot of padding in the seat for your backside and uh, with that limited amount of travel on both the front and the back of the bike, it must have made for quite a bumpy ride when uh, Vic Eastwood and the big AGIS uh, were hitting uh, the whoops. But when it came uh, to the mudguards of our prototype 500, there were uh, no originals in the boxes of spare parts when Terry uh, bought the bike, so it's uh, unclear as to if these uh, would have been either plastic, fiberglass, or maybe even uh, alloy, but uh, I think my guess is it's more than likely it would have been uh, a set of plastic ones as uh, 1970 T was just about around the time uh, off-road bikes were then switching uh, from those uh, brittle fiberglass items to these much more uh, user-friendly uh, plastic affairs. But uh, these black plastic items uh, do uh, have the AGIS uh, manufacturer sticker on them, so these could uh, essentially still uh, be modern AGIS uh, replacement parts. And so as we now move on to the bike's controls department, we have the original handlebars that were fitted to the bike in 1972. And as you can see, the crossbar to strengthen the bars was welded into place and not with clamps as we have nowadays on our more modern bikes. But these were just bolted down onto those top fork yokes by the usual clamps, which you could... Uh, of course, uh, slacken off if you needed to adjust the handlebars to suit your height and uh, riding style. But uh, also on the left-hand side, we have uh, the decompressor uh, lever to operate that uh, decompressor valve in the motor's uh, cylinder just to try and help you uh, kick that big 500 uh, into life. And uh, the clutch and the front brake levers are uh, old school uh, ball end uh, Magura items and uh, both the grips on either end are uh, UFO uh, replacement uh, items. But uh, all of the bike's uh, control cables are uh, all brand new uh, replacements and uh, to be able uh, to tame that 500 Villiers engine uh, you needed a decent uh, on and off switch and uh, so the motor's uh, temper was all uh, kept in check with this uh, Swedish made alloy uh, Gunnar Gasser throttle twist grip which uh, when snapped open 
could certainly uh, make this AGIS 500 fly along. And so to completely construct this bike uh, back to this condition uh, took Terry more than two years to complete. Although, uh, to be fair, uh, this was just one of a few restoration jobs that Terry had ongoing at that time, so he wasn't working on the AGIS 100% uh, uh, of that time. But once NVT had finished uh, building this new prototype in 72, Vic Eastwood then gave it its inaugural debut at the World of Sport uh, Castrol Finals at Caldwell Park in December of that year, and uh, Eastwood uh, literally uh, blew away all of the opposition on that day, beating the likes of uh, top riders including the great uh, Brian Wade, uh, Vic Allen, uh, Badger Goss and even the legend uh, John Banks finished fifth on that day. But Eastwood uh, did comment saying that the bike was more or less uh, flawless on that day apart from having to do a running repair on the flexible uh, rubber joint on that exhaust expansion chamber. But Vic Eastwood uh, took the bike to three race uh, wins, but uh, he did say that the power from that Villiers motor was just beginning to get a bit uncontrollable and he said he had to keep uh, rolling off the power so that he could stay in the bike's seat. But the grunt of that 500 AGIS engine, he said, was just absolutely mental. Now, soon after the completion of that race event, uh, Vicky Swood then stated to the waiting press, uh, saying that this was the very first time that he'd ridden this bike. And he also uh, commented by saying, uh, just you wait, he said, this is going to be the bike to beat in 1973. But of course, uh, Eastwood would never ever see this bike go into full production because soon after that, he had a disagreement with the NVT board who uh, Eastwood claimed had refused to help him uh, develop the bike further, to which end uh, Vic Eastwood then left Norton Villiers Triumph and signed up uh, to race on Michael for the following uh, 1973 racing season. Although the uh, bike's current owner, uh, Terry Pickering, uh, did tell me that even although uh, this bike is uh, super rare and the only survivor of that clandestine uh, Chinditz project. He said that maybe one day he'd still uh, like to see a top rider give it a run out on a racetrack uh, someday. And uh, with all of that history and intrigue surrounding this very unique machine, uh, somehow I don't think there'll be a shortage of interested parties banging on Terry's door to take it uh, for a ride. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that, taking a look at uh, that uh, very rare AGIS 500 uh, prototype, uh, the only one of its kind left uh, on the planet, and of course another fantastic bike, which is uh, part of the Terry Pickering uh, Classic Dirt Bike uh, Collection. So coming up in my next video posting, we're going to take a look at a big uh, four-stroke Husk Varna bike. And uh, this uh, particular machine here was built uh, by the Husk Varna Man uh, Company. And uh, this is a big four-banger uh, twin shocker that's been fitted with all of those very nice uh, tricked up uh, Husk Varna parts. So we'll be taking a look at this bike when we return for my next uh, video posting. But of course, until then, watch what you're doing out there with those old uh, vintage uh, dirt bikes. We want to see you back here again safe and sound so we can take a look at my next uh, video posting here on your number one and favourite classic dirt bike TV channel. <laughs>